going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 is our text. If, if you don't have a Bible with you, uh, that's perfectly fine. There's one around you. If uh, you're at our Sweetwater McCulloch campuses, there's, there's a Bible in the seats around you. Grab that one. If uh, you're at our Parker campus, then there's a table with Bibles on it. Grab one of those Bibles and turn to page 964. And you'll be able to follow along with us. That's where Matthew chapter 6 is in the Bibles, in the seats, or on the table around you. Uh, and as always, whatever campus you're at, if you need a Bible, you want a Bible, then please take one of those with you because we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, uh, it, it is great to see you here tonight. I want to put in a word about summer life. Uh, if you've been doing life groups, then uh, we want you to come and check out Summer Life. Uh, it is a, 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 you know, kind of an in-between group. And it, even if you drive up from Parker, we'd love to have you come here to the Sweetwater Campus. Uh, Thursday night is when it starts. I'm the, the lead-off hitter uh, teacher. So uh, we're going to be talking about why should we even go to church. And uh, if you've got a friend that loves Jesus but struggles with church, it might be a great time to bring them. And uh, it's worth the drive. It's worth the effort to be here at 630 on Thursday. Love to have you come and join us. If you've never tried out life groups, it's a taste. So uh, if you want to know how weird it is, come and check it out. won't be too weird, I promise you. And if it is, you can complain. We'll listen, all right? Uh, the other thing I just want to tell you is, is that uh, our Hawaii mission team is wrapping up their work. They're getting ready to come home. They'll be home this, uh, early this next week. And we had 18 students and adults in Hawaii doing vacation Bible school. They had si over 60 kids that came. This is a mission area. The, the church is a brand new church plant. And they had 10 uh, first-time decisions to follow Christ. Isn't that cool? And... Uh, Eight more rededications, and the pastor there is thrilled and excited, and, uh, and so I just wanted to share that good news with you and be praying for them as they get ready to come home after suffering for Jesus in Hawaii. <laughs> it's tough, but somebody's got to do it. Some of you are like, I think I want to volunteer to work with students. We're okay with that. Uh, that, that that's uh, it's one of those things you can do. Hey, uh, how many of you have any kind of investment, any kind of stock, real estate, 401k, CDs, uh, mutual funds, anything like that. How many of you have some kind of investments? Okay, most of you are raising your hands. Uh, uh, well, uh, th this is for everyone, but I'm just going to invite you to play a little bit of a game. Do you want to make money or lose money on your investments? Okay, anybody want to lose money? No, okay, you know, uh, if so, we, we need to talk because I need your strategy. But... Uh, and we want to make money. We want our investments to pay off. That's why we have investments. That's why we're, you know, uh, putting money in these different things, hoping, praying, uh, you know, trying to figure out the margin so we can, we can, you know, have a lot of money for the future. Now, uh, let, let's play a little bit of a game. Because we, we want to make money, but if only we had known what we know now, right? If only we could have been, go back in time and make some investments. So I did a little bit of research, and here's what I want, want to, to ask you to do. If you could have bought stock in any company at its initial public offering, uh, which one would you have purchased? One company, you can go back in time, you can invest $1,000 in one company, initial public offering. Uh, don't tell me. Tell the person next to you, or if you want to play the game on, at home, write it down, okay? Tell the person next to you, what, what's the company you would have bought stock in if you could go back and go, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this uh, investment down right. Okay, you got, your, you got your answer so they know you can't cheat because I know you're going to talk about this, you know, over dinner, over lunch, over brunch, whatever it is, uh, meal you're going to enjoy after the service. But uh, uh, you got to have evidence so you can say, see, this is what I said. Okay, so here you go. Now you're going to play a game about who is going to make the most money off of you going back in time. So how many of you said that you'd go back and you would have invested in Facebook? Anybody invest in Facebook? A few of you said, yeah, I'd invest in Facebook. Okay, Facebook went public in 2012. If you'd invested $1,000 in Facebook, you'd have $4,600. That's a good return, but it's not amazing. How many of you said you'd invest in Apple? Oh, a lot of hands went up. Oh, a bunch. Okay, so if you invested $1,000 in Apple, it went public in 1980, you would now have $430,000 from that investment. Yeah, some of you are like, if only. Okay, but they're not the best. So uh, how many of you said you would have invested in Amazon? Ah, okay. Not as many as Apple, 
But Amazon went public in 1997, and a $1,000 investment in Amazon in 1997 would today be worth $1.2 million. Yeah, some of us are kicking ourselves. Okay, how many of you said Microsoft? Oh, a lot of hands. There's the number two so far. Microsoft went public in 1986. If you'd invested $1,000 in 1986 in Microsoft, today it'd be worth $1.6 million. Okay. All right, did anybody say Disney? Oh, we got some Disney people over here and over here. All right, Disney. If you invested $1,000 at Disney's initial public offering, 1957, okay, it'd be worth $3 million today. Of course, $1,000 in 57 was real money then. So, uh, all right, there's one more better. How many said Walmart? Anybody say Walmart? There's not one Walmart answer at hand in the entire room. Okay, so in 1970, if you invested $1,000 in Walmart, today it would be worth $12 million. 12, yeah, out of all those companies, and Walmart's the best investment. <laughs> if only we knew then what we know now, right? Except the reality is we know a whole lot more than we actually apply to our lives. A whole lot more. Because Jesus gives us his investment strategy. He tells us how to succeed if we will listen and do what he says. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. This is what Jesus says. Again, if you're, if you're just joining us, we've been in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' longest single teaching in the New Testament that's recorded. And... Uh, and if you apply what he teaches, it will turn your life upside down. Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Those are the words of Jesus to his followers. And so at first glance, we're all in trouble. Because most of us raised our hands about having some kind of investment, right? We've all laid up treasures on earth. And, and, uh, and when you read that, you kind of have to ask yourself, does Jesus desire all of us to live in poverty? <laughs> it's an uncomfortable question, isn't it? Because we, we, uh, we just read that. What does he say? Don't lay out. Okay, what, what's the answer to that? Now, if, if you read the Bible, which, by the way, we encourage you to read the Bible because we believe the Bible is the inspired and errant Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live, and, and so we're applying it to our lives. So if you actually read the Bible, which we really encourage, uh, then the answer is no. Nowhere does God prescribe us living in poverty. Now, Jesus does say the poor are blessed, and most of us don't really believe that, but he does say it. In fact, uh, Jesus had dinner with rich people, there was a woman who anointed Jesus with some really expensive perfume. In fact, if you take the, the value of that perfume in the first century in Jesus' day to today, it was about worth about $50,000 today. She, she gave him a $50,000 gift. Uh, and people were, were angry that she wasted that, and Jesus affirmed her in that. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, challenged the wealthy believers to be generous. So the New Testament does not prescribe poverty for those who follow Jesus. So what is Jesus saying to us? Well, I think Jesus is sharing with us his investment strategy. And he's asking questions that challenge us in how we live our lives. And, and he does this using money. He uses money as that illustration, as that focal point, because he knows how difficult a battle it is for us when it comes to to greed. Because greed is real and greed is alive and well in all of us. And, and it may not be winning in your life, but it is present in your life and it is powerful in your life. 
and, and we have to be on guard against this. And, and God knows this. And so Jesus says, hey, I'm going to confront your investment strategy by talking about things that are really uncomfortable for us. Uh, Jesus does not mind us being uncomfortable. Okay? Doesn't mind it at all. And, and so he's going to look at us, and, and we've already sung songs about yielding our heart to Jesus and giving him our lives, and so he wants to take us at our word. So let's look at Jesus' teachings. Let's hear the questions that this text raises and learn from the one who literally will turn our lives upside down if we will listen to him. First of all, we see in this text the question of priority. The question of priority. Look again at the words of Jesus. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay, he gives some direction about priority because everyone everywhere wants to have enough. I mean, why do we lay up treasures on earth? Why do we, you know, have investments? Why do we store up these things? It's so that we have enough. Now, the people that Jesus is talking to didn't have any savings like we have. They didn't have long-term investments. They were poor people. They lived day to day. He taught them to pray, give us today enough to eat. Most of us, if we say those words, we don't mean them. We have plenty to eat. So he's talking to them, and they're not thinking the same way that we are. Uh, they're thinking, of course, I'm not going to save up stuff because I'm just going to live right now. But we all want enough to eat. We all want enough to live on. We all want enough to thrive. But Jesus challenges us to prioritize the eternal investments over the temporary investments. It, th that's what the contrast is. That's what the challenge is. Do you want to focus on the eternal investments, or do you want to focus on the temporary investments? Because our tendency... Our natural default is to prioritize the temporary because we can see them, right? That's why there's so many commercials about financial planning. We want to save money. We want to plan on retire. And the older I get, the more the conversation seems to be about retirement. Do you have enough? When can you retire? What is your plan? What are you going to do? And Jesus calmly points out that whatever temporary investments you make, whatever stuff you acquire is at risk, right? Moth and rust destroy, thieves break in and steal. It depreciates. It breaks. Somebody wrecks it. Somebody steals it. You can lose it. And by the way, no matter how much you have, you can't take it with you. So that means if you've got a bunch of stuff, your heirs are going to fight over it. Just what happens? And Jesus cautions us. He says, why would you spend your life prioritizing the temporary when it's temporary? Now think about that. This is, this is wisdom that is so obvious and so duh for the Son of God to say to us that we miss it. He says, why are you so focused on acquiring stuff for the here and now, saving up stuff for the here and now, when this is just your short-term, uh, you know, existence. This is temporary. Eternity, which is going to last for ever. Yeah, thank you. One person got that. <laughs> is where you need to be investing. This is where you need to be focused. This is where your priority needs to be. And, and he's just blown away that our priority so often is on the here and now when it's not going to last. And the older you are, the, the more you realize how brief life is. How short life is. So he's saying to us, invest in eternity. Invest in the kingdom of God. You're going to get return. You're going to get dividends that last forever. Now, this point is where there's a temptation for preachers. So can I just go ahead and acknowledge that? Because it's really tempting just to you know, jump off at this point and say, you're going to invest in eternity by giving to the church. Right? And, and sell you on that. And by the way, that if the church is having a, uh, an impact on the community, if they're leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, that is a great investment in eternity. I'm not going to lie about that. That's a true statement. So just uh, to do my 30-second spiel on this, uh, if you give to Calvary, 
I think it's investing in eternal treasure, by the way, because this last year we baptized 152 people. Yeah, 152 people <laughs> proclaim their faith in Christ. we got seven more scheduled for tomorrow morning, by the way. Uh, and, uh, and that's pretty cool. And then I, I went back and looked. In the last 10 years, we've baptized over 1,060 people that have come to faith in Jesus Christ here at Calvary. It's worth investing in. Yeah, I think it's worth celebrating, whatever campus you're on. And, and, and then right now, uh, taking place, we're building a compassion church in Honduras in an area that's, that's suffering from extreme poverty. And we're going to be feeding and, and educating and providing medical care for up to children in 300 families to elevate them out of poverty. That's going on right now. It's part of the investment through Calvary. And because of your generosity and what we do, we've completed over 34 wells, freshwater wells, among the poorest of the poor in Mozambique. And right now, on a daily basis, over 25,000 people have drinking water because of you. See, that's an investment in eternity. And, and, and so, you know, this is, this is going on. So the truth is, that, that's not the selling point that Jesus wants to get off on. That's just a preaching point that, you know, preachers are tempted to camp out on. So let me tell you what eternal investing, investing really is. It, it begins with God and your relationship with God. Because Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the great commandment. If you're going to invest in eternity, you've got to start with your love relationship with God. And, and if that's not happening, then, then you've got a problem. And, and then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your family. Love your you know, people you work with. Love your enemies. That's included in there too. You see, eternal investing is found in loving people and it's found in serving people in Jesus' name. Giving your life away in Jesus' name. Forgiving people in Jesus' name. Being generous in Jesus' name. And leading people to that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the eternal investment. So the question is this, are you investing in the temporal or the eternal? Now, most of you are going to be able to answer both. Well, I'm, I'm investing in both. Because, I mean, this is, you know, a crowd of people who are in a church on a Saturday evening, and I know on, tomorrow on Sunday at, at our other campuses. You, you're in church. You're, you're probably vested in the mission of Calvary. You're probably vested in a lot of this. You're saying, hey, I'm, I'm investing in both. Okay, then which is your priority? Which is your priority? And, and see, so you're not answering that question to me. So you don't have to give an account to me. The answer that, that you could give to me, it doesn't matter if you could convince me to believe you or not. You, you know, you and God know the truth about where you're investing. Because your heart tells you. Because where your treasure is, that's where you're going to find your heart. And that's the place where Jesus challenges us and makes us uncomfortable because he said, hey, here's my investment strategy. Where are you storing up your treasures? Now, I just got to point out that some of you are very successful in investing in the temporal, and you've got to that point where you're more interested in eternal investments. Uh, and so if you want to discuss some strategies for eternal investments, uh, please sit down with one of your pastors and let us talk with you about that, some uh, things that we're aware of that you can invest in, because we're kind of trained kingdom investment advisors. We don't have any commercials on TV or whatever, but that's, that's reality of where we are. So if you're, you know, being nudged by the Spirit saying, hey, I gave you a bunch of stuff, it's time for you to put it to work in the kingdom's uh, uh, advantage, uh, we'd love to, to encourage you and speak into that. So first of all, Jesus asked the question of priority, and then Jesus asked the question of focus. The question of focus. Look at verses 22 and 23. Uh, I, you know, honestly, I kind of like to skate over these for a long time. I love the, the 19 through 21. I love verse 24. But listen to what he says. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, think about blindness, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And, and he's not really counseling us to get our eyes checked. Uh, that's not the point uh, in, in this message. 
what he's challenging us is this. What are you looking at? What are you staring at? What are you fixated on? Where is your focus in life? Uh, Jesus tells us that whatever we're focused on is going to fill our souls. It's going to fill our souls. And, and, and the option is light or darkness. He says if we focus on God, if we focus on his kingdom, if we focus on the character of Christ, our souls are going to be filled with light. Because Jesus is the light of the world. And, and, and if we're followers of Jesus, then, then his light is going to be in us. And we're going to be that light of the world that he told us at the beginning of this message when he said, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men. They may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. How are they going to do that? We, they, that's going to happen if our eyes are fixed on Jesus. If our focus in life is on the things of God and not on the things of the flesh. And if your eye is good, then your whole body is going to be filled with light. But if our life focus is on something else, something else other than God, something else other than the things of God, uh, then our souls are going to be filled with darkness. And we know this darkness. We've tasted the darkness. We've witnessed the darkness. We've walked in the darkness. It might be the darkness of addiction. Shatters families, ruins lives, derails hope. It might be the darkness of anger and rage and revenge and hatred and violence. It might be the darkness of sexual obsession. Whether that's revealed in pornography or adultery or lust. It might be the darkness of greed. You know, money and success and, and stuff. I mean... And we all know, you can tell by our garages that we don't struggle with this, right? It might be the darkness of pride. Pride that says, I have to win at all costs. I must be right at all times. I can never apologize. I can never back down. It might be the darkness of jealousy or gluttony or laziness. How many hours did you spend on the video games? See, the question is this. Are you focusing on darkness or light? Are you focusing on the darkness or light? Now, see, most of us, again, are going to answer, honestly, some of both. Some of both. Well, you know, I, mean, I am in church. I'm focused on Jesus right now at this moment. But what is your life focused on? Is it darkness or is it light? Because if you're focused on darkness, it kind of looks like this. And we still got some exit lights that you can see. I know if you're watching this on the, our you know, campuses, you don't see anything. We're not experiencing technical difficulties. They turned the lights out because I wanted us to see what it's like to be in darkness. When our eyes are bad, when our eyes are fixated on the darkness, then this is what our souls become. And yeah, there's still some of that light around us. We can still see the light in other people, but we're living in darkness. We're living in despair. We're living in destruction. And Jesus is the light of the world. And Jesus wants to shine his light in our lives. Now here's the thing. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and, and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, guess what? His light is in you. And we can all go, yeah, I got the light of Jesus in my life. But, but here's the question. Are, are you walking away from the light? Or are you walking toward the light? Again, if you're on our campuses, I'm disappearing because uh, I'm trying to illustrate this. All of us are on a journey, and all of us daily are making a decision. Am I going to walk toward the light, or am I going to walk away from the light and disappear into the darkness? And right now, your life is on a trajectory, and you're headed one way or the other. Right, you're embracing more of the light and coming into it, or you're walking away from it. And then here's the other question that goes with that. If Jesus is in your life and he's the light of the world, are you living in the light or are you just visiting it on occasion? 
Is the light of Christ a, a, a stopping point in your week? You know, like Saturday night at 5 or Sunday at 8, 9.30 or 11? Or, or are you spending your time living in the light and just taking those little, you know, trips to the darkness? Because we're still sinners. Because if we fill our lives with the light of Christ, it eventually changes everything else so our lives become filled with light. And the more we spend with Jesus, the brighter things become until our lives are filled with his light. Um, that's the question of focus. So are you focusing on darkness or light? Jesus is comfortable making us uncomfortable. So we have the question of priority, we have the question of focus, and, and then Jesus ends with the question of allegiance. Allegiance. Verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. And then he gives us an example. You can't serve God and money. You can't serve God and money. You can't serve God in anything. He, he, what Jesus is doing is describing a reality. He's saying, understand that, that the way we're made, the way we're wired, we don't divide our allegiances really well. Something always wins out. You have a priority. You have a commitment. And we can pay lip service to one, but we'll really be devoted to another. But you're not going to be fully devoted to two. One is going to have a priority, and God wants to be that priority. If we're going to make eternal investments, Jesus wants to be that priority. You see, that's what he's doing. He's challenging our priorities, calling us to that point of saying, who are you committed to? What are you committed to? Because Jesus, well, he's challenging our priority because he wants our heart. Remember, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Jesus wants your heart. And then Jesus is challenging our focus. He wants our attention. He's like, what are you looking at? What are you fixated on? What are you staring at? He goes, I want it to be me because I want to bless you. I want to lead you and you can't follow me if you're not watching me. And he challenges our allegiance because he wants our devotion. He doesn't just want it an hour a week while we're singing praises. He doesn't just want it when we're in life group with our Christian friends. He wants it all the time. He wants our passion. He wants our commitment. He wants our loyalty. And if we give him these things, he will change us. He will turn our lives upside down. He will fill us with eternal treasures, with the light of life, with joy that is everlasting. That's what he's offering us. He says, look, I, I can... I, Look, I can give you stuff, but stuff isn't going to really change your life. What really changes your life is that relationship with the living God. When, when he takes priority, when he rearranges your values, when his wisdom inhabits your soul, when you're drinking in his light and his love, then everything changes. So the final question. Are you devoted to Jesus or anything else? Are you devoted to Jesus or are you devoted to something else? See, that's the question of two masters because Jesus calls us out. By the way, Jesus is disgusted, doesn't have any, you know, patience for a cultural Christianity. Our country was founded on Christian principles, but let's just be honest, it, it became culturally uh, uh, approved to be a Christian for about 200 years. And so a lot of people identified with church because they were supposed to, not because they were committed to Jesus. That world is no longer ours. Praise God. I know there's a lot of people who grieve the, the loss of influence of the church. There's a lot of people who grieve the public standing of Christian principles in the, in the community. I am not one of those. Yeah, I, I, I can grieve parts that, that we lose, but let me just tell you something. The power of God rests in committed people does not rest in the idea that everybody's got to go to church. What matters is the fact that we are sold out to Jesus Christ above everything else because he's not interested in lip service that isn't reality. 
So do you love Jesus more than your success? In other words, if Jesus calls you to downward mobility, are you okay with that? If he calls you to a lower paying job, are you good with that? If he calls you to a demotion instead of a promotion, are you okay with that? Do you love Jesus more than you love your money? One quick look at your checkbook will tell you that. Do you love Jesus more than you love your country? I love our patriotic celebration service, but let's be honest. There's a lot of people who are praising America and tolerating God. Do you love Jesus more than you love your family? Because Jesus said, unless you love me more than father or mother <clears throat> or brother or sister or even son or daughter, you're not worthy of me. You see, some that are sitting here follow Jesus partially. And Jesus is calling you to repentance and commitment tonight. There are some of you that are sitting here that are not yet followers of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is inviting you, calling you to surrender to him, to pledge your life to him so that he can change you. And if that's you and you want to talk to one of us about that, then there are going to be members of our prayer team across the front of every one of our campuses. And, and there are pastors available at the Connection Centers. We would love to talk with you about Jesus Christ and how he can change your life forever. That's what our mission's all about. But every one of us has to decide, is Jesus number one? Is he the master we're going to serve or is there someone else? Because I'll tell you this, I'll, I'll say the Pledge of Allegiance all day long. I get teary-eyed with the Star-Spangled Banner. But the moment my country demands that I lay aside my love for Jesus or my values that he gives me, I'm choosing Jesus. I love my wife. We've been married for 35 years. I praise God that he gave her to me. She is a blessing to me. But there are times when we disagree about direction that we're to go. And if God is telling me to go a direction, I have to disappoint her. She forgives me. I love my kids. I love my grandkids. But there are times that I had to have conversations when they were young, when my girls were young, and now with my grandkids, they're starting to ask. And I say, I'm leaving. And they go, but why are you leaving? I want you here. And I say, I'm leaving because there are people who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to go and I'm going to tell them about Jesus. Is Jesus your master? Because no one can serve two masters. Love the one, hate the other, hold on to one, be devoted to one, despise the other. You can't serve God in anything else. But here's the thing. If you'll give God your priority, if you'll make Jesus your focus, if you'll be devoted completely to him, he will fill your life with incredible blessings, both now and in eternity. Let's pray. Father, we love you. It's amazing that you love us. It's amazing that you uh, have blessed us the way that you have. And we acknowledge that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords and that you have loved us and provided hope for us. And it all boils down to Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for our sins, his resurrection from the dead, the victory over sin and death and hell, and, and that that grace that you give us of life eternal that we don't deserve. So, Father, today we simply give you ourselves once again. We want to be wholly committed to you because you're the one who is wholly committed to us and you demonstrated that on the cross. We love you. We want to love you better. Help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.